When I first read about the Cross the Universe as a teenage Beatles fan, I sneered at it. It sounded so corporate and cheesy that I was thoroughly expecting not to like this movie, but it brought me to tears by the end. Which begs the question, why did this film succeed where the Sgt Pepper movie failed? Hello and welcome to Enchanted Essays. I post new reviews and video essays every Friday, so feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. In this video, I will examine why this film came to be, and examine why You Across the Universe succeeded critically where Robert Sigwood's Sgt Pepper movie failed. This is the second video in a two-part series. In the first, I talked about why the Sgt Pepper movie seemed like a good idea at the time, but failed spectacularly, so you might want to check that one out first. Julie Taymor had been directing theatre since the 70s, but she reached international acclaim with her theatrical adaptation of The Lion King, which won five Tonys and two Oliviers, and with her second feature film, Frida, which won two Oscars. The latter was praised for its unusual style, that replicated the artistic style of its subject matter. I think that the success of Moulin Rouge certainly contributed to the creation of this film. Both Moulin Rouge and Across the Universe are romantic jukebox musicals that follow a young male British artist, who moves abroad to discover himself before he gets taken in by a ragtag group of revolutionary artists who are part of the countercultural artistic movement of their respective historical settings. Both open with an ambiguous prologue of the protagonist singing about his lost love before flashing back to the beginning of the story. Both involve trippy sequences of drug use. Both are in an overly theatrical style that assists in the suspension of disbelief necessary for a movie musical. Whilst I don't necessarily think that Julie Taymor, the writers, purposefully created the story with this in mind, I imagine it's probably what coaxed producers into making the film. After all, despite not being a consideration during production, Moulin Rouge ended up receiving eight Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, and won for both production design and costume design. It was followed by other Oscar winning musicals like Chicago. Therefore, an artsy jukebox musical helmed by the Tony's only female Best Director winner must have sounded like Oscar bait heaven in 2007. However, unlike the Sgt Pepper movie, this historical context doesn't feel like the only reason this film was created. Much like Sgt Pepper, Across the Universe did have an unconventional choice of writers, but they couldn't be more different from music critic Henry Edwards. This film was actually written by Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet, the writing duo best known for their long-running British sitcoms such as Porridge, but who had also been writing screenplays since… well, the year the movie is set. Predictably, they also had a track record of comedy when it came to film, but they also branched out into dramedy, and even wrote the infamous unofficial Bond film Never Say Never Again. Overall, they're an unconventional choice for an artsy musical, which may explain some of the issues with the script, but they are writing about their own generation and really capture the Beatles' own sense of humour. And, most importantly, the film is written by writers. The film follows Jude, a young Liverpudlian dock worker, who leaves behind his mum to find his father in the United States. After a cold and uncomfortable meeting with his dad at Princeton University, he befriends a rebellious young student called Max. Jude instantly becomes smitten by Max's sister Lucy, an innocent but progressive high schooler waiting for her sweetheart to return from Vietnam. But before he can take action, Max announces that he's dropping out of uni and moving to Greenwich Village, New York, taking Jude with him. They move in with the rock singer called Sadie, after his brother is killed in the Detroit race riots, an experimental young guitarist called Jojo comes to New York and joins Sadie's band. The gang are rounded out by Prudence, a young closeted lesbian escaping an abusive boyfriend who develops an unrequited love for Sadie. After Lucy's boyfriend is killed in Vietnam, she moves in with the gang, and Jude dumps his Greenwich Village girlfriend for her. Max gets drafted, but the guys have one last hurrah at a hippie commune where Prudence has found a girlfriend. After Max leaves, things start to fall apart. Sadie leaves Jojo, whilst Jude suspects that the leader of the revolutionaries Lucy has been campaigning with is just trying to sleep with her, causing a rift in their relationship. After trying to protect her at a protest, Jude is arrested and deported as an illegal immigrant. 
Whilst he is back in Liverpool, he sees that Lucy's revolutionary friends blow themselves up in their old flat, leaving him to believe that she was killed too. Max returns from war traumatised and morphine addicted, but writes to Jude, telling him to come back and get Lucy at the launch of Sadie and Jojo's new record on the rooftop of their studio. Now, you may have noticed that I spent a little longer telling the story than I did with Sergeant Pepper. But that's just because Sergeant Pepper is so all over the place that it has plenty of scenes that have no impact on the plot whatsoever. Whilst it's certainly not an ensemble story, the film, for the most part, handles its four storylines surprisingly well. Essentially, it's the story of a generation, so multiple storylines make sense. My two issues with the story were that there are three songs back to back that seem to have very little impact on plot and character development, and we see very little of Prudence after she meets her girlfriend. Obviously, her arc is now complete, but it would be nice if she was in the film a bit more before the end to reinforce the theme of love overcoming obstacles or something. Besides, it's not so satisfying to have this conflict resolved off screen. I would have preferred a song about these two rather than Mr. Kite. We didn't have time for three songs about the characters going on a trippy experience. Two songs are more than enough when the only impact any of them have on the plot is one line of dialogue in between telling us that the storyline that had such emotional resonance at the beginning of the film has been resolved off screen. Maybe it's something to do with when this came out. I imagine it was far more risque to show a happy lesbian relationship than a lesbian's unrequited love in 2007. We don't even see Rita at the end of the movie with Prudence in the band. Another weakness of the script is the fact that there are characters who don't appear elsewhere in the movie that the characters are talking to. Sure, I'm certain that their friend group is extended to more than just six people, but I think it would be nice if that meant that we got more dialogue from characters that needed more screen time anyway. As for the dialogue, it seems pretty believable, but it's pretty hard to compare to Sgt Pepper in terms of quality, as it had no dialogue aside from narration. However, it adds the necessary context to the songs, especially in this more grounded setting. Across the Universe definitely feels like they cherry-picked appropriate songs from the Beatles' entire back catalogue to fit the story, rather than getting the rights to most of the songs from the Beatles' two most successful albums and writing a story around that. It mostly feels like they wrote a story that just happened to fit the Beatles' songs, which is what a jukebox musical should sound like. It's not afraid to use lesser known early songs such as I've Just Seen a Face and Hold Me Tight, which suit the story. It also uses later Beatles songs later in the movie, as the setting mirrors the later events in the 60s and the characters alluded drug use mirrors the drug use of the Beatles themselves. First of all, there are songs with meanings that don't deviate too far from the original meaning of the song. This is much easier with songs from earlier in the Beatles career as many were written as love songs to appease their young female audience. These include Hold Me Tight, All My Loving, I've Just Seen a Face and It Won't Be Long. Lucy's a feminist with rebellious ideas from the beginning, but she still has an innocent girl next door quality until that innocence is shattered by Daniel's untimely death. So it seems appropriate that these songs are sung by or about her. Come Together uses the song's lyrics to describe Jojo, whilst the visuals establish New York itself juxtaposing the straight-laced businessmen of the financial district with the expressive community of Greenwich Village. When I brought up that there is a closeted gay character in this movie, I'm sure many Beatles fans will assume that this film features You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, a song that many suspect Lennon and McCartney wrote about their manager Brian Epstein, a closeted gay man who sadly died shortly before homosexuality was legalised. However, they chose instead to take I Want to Hold Your Hand an innocent plea to a sweetheart for some mild affection, and turns it into a heartbreaking song about unrequited love. And it works! If I Fell is originally about asking your new lover not to break your heart like your ex did, but Lucy splits the character of the ex into two, referring to her own past romance, and referring to the girl that Jude dumps for her. She's the last character to sing a song from before 1967, which makes sense. She is the most innocent from a very traditional conservative area, so it makes sense that she sings a song with more innocent lyrics. Across the universe avoided songs that narrated stories themselves, 
such as She's Leaving Home or Maxwell Silver Hammer. Instead, they are songs in which the characters express their feelings, which is a better thing to spend our time on and doesn't have the issue of why someone is narrating something. They also don't overstay their welcome. Whilst the full versions are available on the soundtrack, some of them are over in a minute and a half in the film itself, especially at the beginning. Whilst it has roughly the same amount of songs, Sgt Pepper feels like it weighs down the film with pointless songs and pointless scenes. Even the ones that did make sense in the narrative go on for too long. Unless the song is showing off exposition or an interesting dance number, Across the Universe keeps it to just a couple of verses. Something I actually forgot to mention in my Sgt Pepper video is the four tracks sung by characters as performances. They offered nothing about the characters. This is especially a waste when you consider that Oh Darling, the emotionally potent song Paul wrote when John suggested breaking up the band, is just sung diegetically with no relation to how the characters are feeling. Across the Universe also includes four diegetic tracks, but these are also used to tell us something about those singing them. We first see Sadie perform Why Don't We Do It In The Road, which reinforces the sexual energy that we've been getting off her so far. We also get plenty of dialogue in this brief scene, so it doesn't take up too much time. The next song we see her perform is Oh Darling. This scene starts out as a performance. However, Jojo has already overheard Sadie's manager planning to get rid of him and starts to make it a duet to rub her the wrong way and point out the irony of the lyrics. Sadie's performance of Helter Skelter plays over Lucy and Jude's arrests. This is where everything finally falls apart for Jude and Lucy. It's the least related to the story, but it's a good soundtrack for the panic and chaos of the scene. Finally, we see Sadie and Jojo singing Don't Let Me Down on the roof of their studio. This time, it is very much a planned duet, where they sing in harmony. This is not only the characters performing, it is a couple promising not to make the same mistakes. Oh, and I also forgot to mention today in the life in Sgt Pepper, because it was completely bloody pointless. Unlike George Martin's work on the Sgt Pepper soundtrack, Elliot Goldenthal and the guest artists aren't afraid to do something more experimental with the Beatles' repertoire. The more sombre arrangements of I Want to Hold Your Hand and If I Fell suit the new interpretation, whilst While My Guitar Gently Weeps does feature electric guitar, its introduction is more reminiscent of the sombre and reflective tone of George's original acoustic demo. I Want You has some militaristic drums and is sung by a male chorus of soldiers during Max's recruitment, before moving to something slower that reflects the longing and lust of the lyrics, as they apply to different characters singing about different emotions. The two songs that stand out the most are I Want to Hold Your Hand because of how different the emotion is, and for the benefit of Mr Kite because it doesn't really work, but I'll focus on this later. I think the alt-rock band Secret Machines, who works on I Am The Walrus and whose covers of Flying and Blue Jay Way can also be found on the soundtrack, are really interesting. Their sound is almost as ambitious as the Beatles themselves during that period. I mean, Bowie was a big fan of them, which tells you all you need to know, really. The core cast is mostly made up of a combination of actors who can sing and singers who can act. There are no real weak links out of the six of them, although I am pretty sure that this film failed because Jim Sturgis upset an ancient burial ground or something, because he seems to be cursed to only be in films that are either critically panned or financial failures. Anyway, there are no barriers of acting ability to distance us from feeling for the characters, nor do they lack singing voices that distract us from the music. They have a variety of vocal styles that suit the personality of the characters, such as Sexy Sadie's raunchy rock vocals and Clean Cut Lucy's musical theatre style voice. None of them were big stars. Evan Rachel Wood was an established dramatic child actress and had already had a Golden Globe nomination at the age of 16. But she was still, by no means, a box office draw. Wood's performance is a standout one for me, as we see her mature from an innocent teenager to an angry and desperate activist. Unlike Sgt Pepper's bloated celebrity appearances, Across the Universe has only three songs by celebrity guest stars. Come Together is essentially a chorus number, but with Joe Cocker taking up the members of the chorus, as a homeless man, a pimp and a hippie. This is a fantastic choice, 
as Cocker was best known for his cover of With a Little Help From My Friends. The film even uses a similar arrangement for the end of their version of the song. Next there's Bono as the Timothy Leary style figure Dr. Robert, singing I Am The Walrus, as well as the cover of Lucy in the Sky With Diamonds during the end credits. Bono is neither particularly good or bad, he's just fine. I think the weakest musical number of the film is Eddie Izzard's performance of For the Benefit of Mr. Kite. Whilst Izzard is a great comedian and they certainly do their best here, I think that Eddie's improv comes off as irritating rather than witty. There's a special feature where you see an unused take and it's very clearly improvised. Spoken word covers are also hard to pull off. Whilst George Martin produced a cover that was completely spoken with Billy Connolly, it works much better with its immersive sound design and steam organ. That version wasn't really a song at all, it was more of a poem. You can't just Rex Harrison it. Unless of course you are Rex Harrison. On the whole, the film relied on casting suitable actors rather than big stars for the lead roles, and it paid off. This means that we can emotionally engage with the characters, even when they aren't singing fantastic songs, instead of having to put up with the blank stares of Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees for two hours. What celebrity guests we do get are mostly fine, but it's only really Joe Cocker that makes a big impact in my opinion. Unlike the Sgt Pepper movie, it makes sense for most of them to be there, and they don't feel like the entire story has been written around including as many cameos as possible. Tamor's theatrical sensibilities work well here. Modern movie musicals generally have to work with establishing the suspension of disbelief. We're so used to a single naturalistic style in cinema, but movie musicals now tend to either establish that all of the songs are dream sequences, or the whole film is made in a theatrical artistic style that suspends disbelief throughout. This is why it works so well for animation, as the audience always had to suspend their disbelief whilst watching drawings talk. While Sgt Pepper either didn't have the commitment or budget to pull off the minimalist or overly symbolic style of either of Stigwood's previous rock opera movies, Tamor isn't afraid to use artistic flourishes especially when the characters start using LSD. In fact, it's something about the Mr. Kite scene that I actually like. The use of puppetry, masks and animation work well in this scene, as do the masks in the anti-Vietnam protest. This is in stark contrast to Sgt Pepper, which never committed to a more bizarre aesthetic, making its fantastical story feel out of place. Whilst the plot of Across the Universe is grounded in reality, this only makes the fantastical imagery more interesting and exciting. Although there may have been a trend that contributed to the creation of this film, it doesn't prioritise clout over quality. It's by no means a perfect movie, as critics were very split on this one, but there is really no argument over whether or not it's a better film than the Sgt Pepper movie. But do you know what the sad thing is about all of this? Sgt Pepper was financially successful, whilst Across the Universe bombed. Whilst there are almost certainly other factors, at the end of the day, the stunt casting worked in Sgt Pepper's favour. Hollywood still knows that the cast list is often the main reason tickets are sold, although publicly smearing Tamor for insisting on her cut of the film probably didn't do the studio any favours. Would I recommend Across the Universe? Absolutely. Is it for everyone? Of course not. I know that plenty of people will find Julie Tamor's artistic flourishes too pretentious for their taste, and that's okay. But I think it's worth a try. If you aren't its audience, I'm sure you'll know someone who is. Musical Hell and Musicals with Cheese did a fantastic video explaining their two different opinions of this movie, so I would recommend watching that if you are still on the fence about whether or not this film is for you. Chances are, if you like musicals or arty movies or trippy movies or the 60s or the Beatles or dramatically different cover songs, then you'll probably get something out of it. I generally don't think the flaws I discussed here really hindered the enjoyment of the film. I actually had to cut this video down to just the points that were relevant to this comparison rather than just gushing about everything I love about this film. Even when I thought I couldn't love the works of the Beatles more than I already did, some of these songs mean even more to me now as a result of the context in which this film uses them. 
I would also love to see a visually spectacular stage adaptation of this. After all, if they made a Tony-nominated Broadway adaptation of Xanadu, one of the two films that inspired the Razzies, then why not across the universe? What few issues there are with this film could easily be cleared up with a longer runtime, especially if they cut or trimmed down the drug trip sequence and instead spent more time on storylines other than Lucy and Jude. With its large core cast, it would also be ideal for community theatre and high school productions, giving it a life long after its professional run. Which song is your favourite? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you want me to make more content like this, you can let me know by liking the video. I'm already planning some more classic rock content, so subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want to see some more of that. If you feel like buying me a coffee, you can tip me on Ko-fi. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Anyway, I've got to go. See you soon! If he dies, I'll bleed and kill him! <laughs>